Hey guys, today I will present a solution to IMO 2021 problem 2 as suggested in the comments. We are asked to show that the following inequality holds for all x1 up to xn real numbers. The sum of i and j going from 1 to n respectively of the square root of the absolute value of xi minus xj is less than or equal to the same sum, so going from i equal to 1 up to n and j equal to 1 up to n of the square root of the absolute value of xi plus xj. An idea for solving this problem is that one can realize that shifting all of these variables by some equal constant uh, will not change the value of the left side. Therefore, it is a good idea to investigate the behavior of the right side of our inequality when shifting all the variables by some constant. Therefore, I define a function f of t, which is the value of the right side of our inequality if we replace the variables xi by xi minus t. What we would like is to find the real number t such that f of t becomes minimal, because then we can bound the right side of our inequality from below by f of this particular t and that it would be enough to prove our inequality in this special case where we replace xi by xi minus t. To find our value for t, let's investigate the graph of our function. And to begin with, we only want to consider an easier case where we don't have some double sum of those terms, but only consider uh, a function like the square root of absolute value to alpha minus 2t for some fixed value of alpha. It has a minimum here at t equal to alpha. And um, going to positive and negative infinity, it also grows to infinity. Now our function is the sum of many such terms. So let's at least consider the sum of two such functions. So we consider another function, the square root of absolute value of 2 alpha 1 minus 2t and then of course we're going to rename this by alpha 2 and I'm going to draw in the graph of that and the sum of both functions. We see that also the blue sum of these two functions has local minima only at alpha 1 and alpha 2 and that it goes to positive infinity when t goes to infinity and when t goes to negative infinity. Therefore Whenever we sum such functions up, we might try to prove that such a sum only attains its global minimum at one such point alpha i. And that is what we're going to try to prove about f of t. Having minima on boundaries of intervals, which we want to prove about the function f, reminds us of concavity. So we would like to prove that f is concave within these respective intervals. To do that, let us first notice that the square root of x is indeed concave from 0 to positive infinity. We want to prove that this is true, so let's plug in the definition for concavity into that function. So this is exactly the inequality that we need to prove, and the interpretation of this when looking at the graph is just that when we take any line under such a curve, of course this is not the square root of x but uh, very similar, that the entire line lies below our given graph. Since we work in the non-negative reals, we can square both sides to simplify, which yields, so we have some x and y terms, and this square root of x, y term here. So we can bring the x and y terms to the right. Therefore, this is equivalent to two lambda, one minus lambda, square root of x, y, should be less than or equal to x times lambda minus lambda squared, which equals lambda times 1 minus lambda times x, plus y times 1 minus lambda minus y times 1 minus lambda squared, and this is also equal to lambda 1 minus lambda times y. Here we have two cases. If lambda is 0 or 1, then the inequality is just 0 less than or equal to zero, which is five. Otherwise, if we have lambda not equal to zero or one, then lambda must lie in the open interval from zero to one, and therefore lambda times one minus lambda would be positive, which would mean that we would have to prove 
2 times the square root of xy is less than or equal to x plus y, which is true from the AMGM inequality. Therefore, we have proven our claim, and furthermore, we can conclude that our function, square root of absolute value of 2 alpha minus 2t, this is of course concave from alpha to infinity, because multiplying with 2 and shifting t by alpha doesn't change anything about that. And because this is symmetric by alpha, this is also concave going from negative infinity up to alpha. And I want to write this down in a slightly different way, namely that this is concave on any interval i such that i is a subset of alpha to infinity or i is a subset of negative infinity to alpha. Before we apply all of this to our function f, let's consider the value t star where f actually attains its minimum. To see why f actually attains its minimum, let's note that the lemurs of t going to positive infinity and of f of t and the limits of t going to negative infinity of f of t is positive infinity. Therefore, we can choose a capital T in the interval from 0 to infinity such that for all x and r with absolute value at least t, we have f of x greater than f of 0. Since the closed interval from negative t to t is compact and f is continuous, we know that there exists a t star in the closed interval from negative t to t, such that f of t star is the infimum of f of this interval, which therefore is also the minimum of f of the closed interval from negative t to t. By our choice of capital T, any x and r which lies outside of that interval has also a larger f value than f of t star because f of t star is less than or equal to f of 0 because 0 lies in that interval. And therefore, this is also the minimum of f of r. Now, we let alpha 1 up to alpha capital N be the set capital A, which we define to be the set of xi plus xj over 2, where i and j are indices. We also want alpha 1 up to alpha n to be pairwise distinct and ordered, so let alpha 1 be less than alpha 2 and so on, and all of this be less than alpha capital N. Using these alpha i, we can define the intervals that we are interested in. So we defined alpha 0 to be negative t and alpha n plus 1 to be t for a better notation. And now these intervals have exactly the behavior that we want. Namely, the interval from minus t to t lies in the union of all of those intervals. So uh, the union of k equal to 0 up to capital N of IK. And furthermore, we know that all of these summons are by the choice of these alpha i concave inside of each interval. And therefore, the sum f of t is also concave inside of each of those intervals. So, f is concave on IK. Due to this first property and the fact that t star lies in that interval, we know that there exists some index k star such that t star lies in IK star. Now we are ready to prove that t star is actually one of those points alpha i. To do that, we need to show that a concave function on a closed interval attains its minimum at one of its endpoints. So we can make use of the definition of concavity, but first let us define lambda such that t 
t star is equal to lambda alpha k star plus 1 minus lambda alpha k star plus 1. And the suitable value for lambda is alpha k star plus 1 minus t star divided by alpha k star plus 1 minus alpha k star. We get that f of t star is greater than or equal to lambda times f of alpha k star plus 1 minus lambda f of alpha k star plus 1. Now these two coefficients 1 minus lambda and lambda are non-negative. Therefore we can plug in lower bounds for f of alpha k star and f of alpha k star plus 1 into this expression. We will use just the minimum and multiplying that by lambda and adding 1 minus lambda times that will exactly yield the minimum of f of alpha k star and f of alpha k star plus 1 for a lower bound of this expression. So we may assume that t star is actually alpha k star or alpha k star plus 1 because we only want f to attain a minimum at t star. Let us write v log t star is equal to alpha k 0. And lastly, we want to rule out that k 0 is not 0 or capital M, but this is of course true because f of capital T and f of K minus capital T is greater than f of 0 and therefore definitely not the global minimum of f. So here k0 is not in 0 or capital M plus 1. And so finally we get what we wanted, that t star is equal to x i0 plus x j0 over 2. We have established that f attains its global minimum at sum x i0 plus x j0 over 2. Now we define x i prime as x i minus x i0 plus x j0 over 2 and want to show that it is enough to prove our inequality for these x i prime. And to do that, let us first subtract the left side from the right side. Then we obtain here, we can plug in our definition for f, which states that this part is equal to f of 0, and therefore this is equal to f of 0 minus the remaining sum. By definition, f of 0 is greater than or equal to f of x i 0 plus x k 0 over 2. And we also know that this is equal to the absolute value of x i prime minus x j prime. So we can rewrite this double sum in terms of x i and x j prime. And now we plug in the definition for f again to obtain that this is equal to the double sum of i going from 1 to n and j going from 1 to n of the square root of absolute value x i plus x j minus x i 0 plus x j 0. Here we notice that this term indeed equals the absolute value of x i prime plus x j prime. And of course we have to carry over this double sum as well. Therefore all of this is equal to the expression in line 1 but in terms of x i prime instead of x j prime. So we have a double sum again of square root of x i prime plus x j prime minus the square root of x i prime minus x j prime absolute value again. From this we conclude that it is indeed enough to show that this is greater than or equal to zero or in other words to show that the inequality is true for x i prime. We notice here that x i zero prime and x j zero prime have special values namely x i zero prime is equal to x i zero minus this so x i zero minus x j zero over two and this is the negative of x j zero prime. Taking a look at the inequality we notice that the square root of absolute value 
xi0 prime minus xi prime for any i is the same as the square root of x absolute value xj0 prime plus xi prime because this term inside the absolute value is exactly the negative of that one and we get an analogous identity when swapping i0 and j0 here. Therefore, we get a lot of cancellation in the term that we are interested in, namely the sum of uh, the double sum of i and j going from 1 to n of this, the square root of the absolute value of xi prime plus xj prime minus the square root of absolute value of their difference. If i0 is not equal to j0, then all of the i0 terms of that sort are going to cancel out with the respective j0 terms here and the other way around. And if i0 equals j0, then all of the terms on this side with i0 are going to cancel out with the respective terms with i0 again because x i0 prime is then going to be 0 and therefore in any case this is equal to the double sum of i and j going from 1 to n but where we only restrict ourselves to i and j not equal to i0 and j0 so we get the same sum but there are only n minus 1 or n minus 2 possible values for i and j and therefore we can finish by induction because we know that if the statement holds for n minus 1 and n minus 2 always then it must always also hold for n now another edge case is where n is exactly equal to 1 but in that case i0 is definitely going to be equal to j0 so we only need the induction for n minus 1 so the last thing to do is to check the case for n is equal to 0, which we have not dealt with so far at all, but that is just a trivial case because here we have 0 less than or equal to 0, which is true, and therefore we are done.